Welcome back to Dialogue on Public Issues. I'm John Chowning with Campbellsville University. In this uh, episode of Dialogue on Public Issues, I'm very pleased to be interviewing a gentleman that has been a friend for about 20 years and has been here at Campbellsville on prior occasions, Dr. William Turner. Dr. Turner, wel welcome back. Great to see you again. Is it okay if I call you Bill in uh, this interview? Yes, sir, let's do that. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, I uh, am, uh, I'll kind of go backwards, I'm a, a, a grandfather, uh, a four times a father, I've been married 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I met uh, just as I had graduated from University of Kentucky in 1968. After that I went to graduate school in Notre Dame where I uh, uh, studied uh, anthropology and, but uh, to, you know, go back to my fundamental roots, uh, I grew up in Harlan County. Mm. I was born and raised in the same town where my mother was born and raised. My mother was born in Benham, Kentucky in 1924. And uh, my father uh, was raised across the mountain from Lynch, Kentucky, where I grew up. My father grew up uh, just near a little town called Appalachia, Virginia. Mm. Uh, so uh, I'm from a long line of coal mining families, you might say, going back to my great grandparents. And uh, I've spent most of my life, I graduated high school in Lynch, went to University of Kentucky, as I said earlier. Uh, and uh, now I'm uh, semi-retired, I'd say, like you probably, John. Mm -hmm. And uh, we live uh, in Houston with our three adult children are there. Uh, both of our sons are married. Our daughter is not married, but we, our family, the 11 of us, thank God we live in the same town uh, at, you know, at, this, at this present time. We're mm -hmm. just blessed for that. One of the things uh, throughout your career that you have done is raising awareness of studying the experience of uh, the African American community in Appalachia, mm -hmm. which is, I, I think there's a presumption among many that there weren't very many right, African Americans right. in the Appalachian Territory. Mm -hmm. Comment on that, if you would, please. Oh, yeah, no problem. You know, interestingly enough, uh, this year we're commemorating the 400th year of the hate the word introduction of enslaved people mm -hmm. into the United States, but it was in 1619, right. uh, somewhere on the Virginia coast uh, near Roanoke, uh, not Roanoke, near, uh, mm, what's wrong, near Hamptons Road, about right. that way. Right. Well, the fact of the matter is there were black people who came into what was the PD Valley, PD River Valley of South Carolina and moved into what we know today as the Smoky Mountains which is part of Appalachia. And they did so with Spanish conquistadors uh, in the 1500s. Mm. So really, uh, it was 100 years before slaves came to the United States. That's the men who were Africans uh, who accompanied Spanish explorers into uh, what we know today as Appalachia. But yes, you're, you're so right. When you look at the typical media image of Appalachia, when you go through the most stereotypical Beverly Hillbillies or Hee Haw show, mm -hmm. uh, when you look at those images of the mountains of the South, uh, the only thing you would think that is black in Appalachia is coal. Mm -hmm. But to the contrary, uh, black people uh, have been part of the landscape, the cultural landscape, and in the context of coal mining in terms of that nation building industry, uh, 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 what school child, at least in our generation, doesn't remember uh, the legend of John Henry, the steel driving man that mm -hmm. beat the machine in West Virginia. Uh, uh, so blacks have been part of the landscape of Appalachia forever. I would even mention, for example, that the most, probably one of the most famous of African Americans uh, was a man named Booker T. Washington. Mm. Uh, Booker T. Washington was a coal miner. Mm -hmm. He worked in a coal mine in Malden, West Virginia, outside of Charleston, and this was in the uh, late 1800s. There's uh, Carter G. Woodson, whom we know as the father of Black History Month, mm -hmm. African American history. Right. He too was a West Virginian. Uh, so that, uh, for that matter, uh, more locally, uh, Appalachia, not far away is Berea College, where Dr. Woodson attended and graduated in 1898. Mm. So despite all of the stereotypes of Appalachia as a white homogenous space, 
uh, Appalachia is as diverse as any mm -hmm. part of the country. For example, where I grew up in Harlan County in Lynch, in the mid 40s when I was born, there were 48 nationalities. Mm. You could run into somebody named Huesca, somebody named Vicini, somebody named Papuchek, somebody named Willie May, uh, somebody named Willetta. There were people whose names were uh, Vicini. So there was this rich mm -hmm. mixture of the Carusos. There were people who were Latino uh, in the town where we grew up because they all came, many of them came through Ellis Island and they were working men out of Italy and Yugoslavia and mm -hmm. uh, parts of Eastern Europe. And so they came directly into, uh, after they left Ellis Island, they came into Pennsylvania's bituminous coal fields and then a little bit later they were in Eastern Kentucky's coal fields. So you grew up in a multicultural I grew up, community. Yeah, yeah. I've told many people I never thought of myself as a minority until I left home. <laughs> That's when the first time I heard that word, mm -hmm. like what are you referring to? Because we lived uh, in a place where these coal companies mm -hmm. bought people from all over Europe and from the South to work in the coal country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, your visit to, to Campbellsville on this occasion, you've b made prior visits here through the years, uh, is tied to the annual Martin Luther King uh, celebration holiday uh, emphasis. Uh, it's been 52 years approximately since his assassination, his uh, killing in uh, April 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, why do you think it's important that we still uh, talk about Dr. King still uh, ha have the annual holiday, uh, discuss his legacy, talk about his dream, emphasize his life? Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow uh, had a poem, and a line in the poem went as follows. The lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives more sublime, for in departing, they leave behind them footprints in the sands of time. Mm. So all of us uh, are required, or we should be, to be students of history, mm -hmm. because that is where we get our inspiration. That's where we learn about what we did, the, the tracks that people left. So this man, and uh, I think he would probably, in his own words, be uh, low to have so much memory of himself, but he was probably one of the greatest persons, uh, at least in my lifetime, uh, to, to walk this, this earth and bring us to see that uh, there are words written in the Declaration of Independence about the unalienable truths, uh, the unalienable rights of people of all races and creeds and colors, and he certainly reminded us of those words from the book of Acts that say, God hath made of one blood all nations of men. Mm. And so Dr. King was the very personification, uh, that kind of moral clarity. It came along and spoke so eloquently and touched so many to say, these things we must do. And so every now and then, like Haley's Comet, some woman, some man comes along and we all stop and we're touched by that person's life. And certainly uh, in the context of America's history with the original sin that is called of slavery. And as you remember when he gave that great I Have a Dream speech, it was exactly 100 years after the end of the, s uh, 100 years after Abraham Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation and he was saying, we're still on this lonely island of poverty. Mm. We're still living a hundred years later. And so now we're, what, 58 years from 1963, mm -hmm. uh, 52 years from the day that he was taken from us. And we have to remind ourselves uh, that that event meant as much as Iwo Jima, it meant as much as Pearl Harbor Day, uh, it meant as much as the day that we declared our Declaration of Independence. So there's just two or three days like that in our history. But we also, when we remember those days, we should find ourselves getting recommitted mm -hmm. to doing what we are remembering because we just can't remember it because it's a dynamic process of human betterment mm -hmm. and that we can do better. And uh, America is one of the only places where we can do better 
because it's in our collective DNA to do better. And even though we go back and forth and we get these highs and these lows, there's still this hope that he expressed in that dream uh, that we're still trying to realize. Mm -hmm. So that for me is why we stop on this day, but I also quickly add is why we sh must start again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have to wait till mid-January. To, to, to what extent do you think, Dr. Turner, we, by having the holiday, and I'm not questioning the wisdom of having the holiday or the need to have the holiday, but to some extent has it become, for some people at least, uh, just uh, a day to pat themselves on the back, to get together, yeah. to hold an observance, to feel good, and then to, to, to move on with the status quo. Mm -hmm, right. I, I remember uh, quoting uh, Kevin Cosby, Reverend Kevin Cosby, uh, help me with his church in Louisville. St. Stephen's. St. Stephen's, mm -hmm. who said a dozen years ago, the Martin Luther King holiday has become somewhat of a sophisticated Groundhog Day. Mm. And that metaphor just kind of jumped out at me because uh, next month early, you know, those people will gather in Poxatawney, Pennsylvania, I guess mm -hmm. it is, to see if Phil's going to come out of the hole. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here we are where in America we can sometimes become so ritualistic, we lose sight of the reason why we're doing these mm -hmm. things and get much more caught up in just kind of doing them as a ritual. So I have witnessed uh, in my own life much too many, many times more than I'd like to remember uh, how people will come out on this day, but if you try to gather them together two weeks from now, uh, they will not be inclined. Uh, for example, uh, I uh, was so happy today as part of our being together, we met with the folk with Greater Campbellsville United. Mm -hmm. And see, it's that kind of every month effort, every week effort, people meeting to say, you know, the King Holiday is fine, but Campbellsville and its greater community must be united around critical issues in July and September and October and throughout the year and not just come together uh, for a kind of formalistic mm -hmm. uh, King Day. And as you know, we, we see people do this with our most sacred of holidays at Christmas mm -hmm. when people uh, are so uh, commercialized into right. uh, the uh, gift exchanging uh, that uh, we often leave Christ out of Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's equivalent to be clear that we're just not here uh, taking a day off because it's uh, the politically correct thing to do. We, we have forgotten in 2020 that uh, in many ways, Dr. King was a very unpopular mm. oh, yeah. person, mm -hmm. very controversial mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Comment Could on that. Let me comment on that easily. Uh, uh, when I was uh, 18, 19 years old, uh, in the 60s, uh, you couldn't be very far away driving out of Harlan County or coming toward this area of the state. Throughout the South, you would see 20-foot billboards that were 20 feet high that would have a picture of Martin Luther King up on it and say, this man is a communist. He's the most dangerous man in America. So. Yes, we, 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 we have to make sure that our young people uh, don't get too caught up in the Disney character that uh, we have made Dr. King into. It's one thing to, to go to practically every large city in the United States and a lot of cities that aren't that large, and you run into these Martin Luther King Jr. drives. And we highways. have one in Campbellsville. Oh, you have one in Campbellsville. Mm -hmm. And as you probably know, more often than not, when you get off the main thoroughfare where the exit to it is, it goes to an African-American community nine times out of ten. Uh, but to the, and I, I'm thankful for that recognition, uh, that kind of uh, perpetual memory uh, that you're getting off on King Drive. But do we see Dr. King when we see the homeless person uh, on King Drive? Do we work for Dr. King when we see uh, the child on King Drive who is uh, neglected or the woman who is abused and any number of uh, people who are marginalized for, for various reasons. So yeah, we have, we have to get away from the commercialization of this day. Uh, just two days ago, I think it was, and it wasn't the first time, but this was the eighth time, I think, 
that uh, an organization basically associated with Second Amendment rights decides to have a Save Our Guns Day in Richmond, Virginia, but they do it on the King holiday, which I guess some people say, well, that was a stroke of genius, because otherwise, how could you have gotten 22,000 people to get away from wherever they were to come because everybody's off that day? But I don't think they spent very much time talking about the Prince of Peace uh, in Richmond the other day when they hold us on King Day. And as you know, too, the ski lodges get filled up on that Monday because they have a long weekend, and a lot of people go have a nice winter vacation mm -hmm. because you can go from Friday until Tuesday on King weekend, and uh, they don't go. Uh, uh, I've done uh, some research on it, and in uh, 10 cities that I looked at, the King Day celebrations always tended to be held in African-American churches mm -hmm. or on a college campus. So that still, we're finding ourselves with a, re with a reflection of Dr. King's greatest challenge to his fellow clerics when he did his letter from a Birmingham jail. And he said, you guys should be in here with me. If you are a man of the cloth, if you are a woman who is a Christian and you believe in God, then we should be doing this together. And one of Dr. King's greatest distractors was the organized religious church. Mm -hmm. And it was a, you know, you know yourself, it was much of a fight to say that how can you be in that sacred place and not be a part of this movement? So we now have some similar issues that divide us, everything from climate issues to issues with lifestyle to issues with uh, health care that we get divided along, and Dr. King talked about those same things 50 years ago, not to mention uh, that Dr. King was a staunch uh, opponent of this military industrial complex mm -hmm. that he talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, uh, his words, his ideas, his themes, his philosophies, and his methods, because at the end of the day, he was devout, uh, he embraced Gandhi's idea of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we now live in a country where uh, 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 more people die of gun violence in the United States than any other place on earth. Uh, there's probably been people, uh, one city in particular, Chicago, you know, so we could, we could go all around the country. Louisville has the same issues. And these are things that we just not, only are we not fighting them, it's as though we've decided to just take them for mm -hmm. granted as it's a part of life mm -hmm. to have violence. And Dr. King would say, no, it is not. There are things we can do to stench this violence. So a year before his death, he caused a great uh, controversy with his yeah. opposition to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that caused division even within the ranks of the black within movement, it, did it in, not? In fact, the black, uh, there, were, there were many African-American uh, clerics who said, now Martin, you step out of line here. We mm -hmm. are a civil rights organization. Mm -hmm. But he saw a synthesis. Uh, he instead saw a wholeness, a relationship that was global, mm -hmm. that was saying the peasant in Phnom Penh is no different than the poor woman in Phoenix City, Alabama. So, you know, Dr. King was far ahead of his time, uh, uh, dangerously so, uh, because he questioned militarism. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we all know if, if we were looking at this table, this circular table, as a piece of the American pie that uh, is comprised of our various uh, ways of paying taxes and how it gets spent, 60% of that pie goes to military, uh, 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 goes to the military. Mm -hmm. And a much smaller percentage, of course, when you consider the other 40%. And Dr. King was the man who talked about guns or butter. And this gets to be a critical issue, I think, even where people will question your, your, your patriotism. Mm -hmm. If you question, why are we doing that? Mm -hmm. uh, why, can't, why must we be, as Dr. King said, the policemen of the world? Who are we to go and say uh, our way or no way? Who are we to say our vital natural interests, national interests, uh, require us to maintain the largest military force in the world 
And uh, well, I could go on and on. There's a checklist because we're still faced with these same we're issues. We're still having some of that very debate right now. Very debate right so, now. Some of those very same words mm -hmm. are being spoken right that's, now. That's correct. And, and he was also moving toward the issue not of just black poverty, but poverty in a broader sense, uh, was he not? One of the first places, one of the first comments he made uh, after uh, that he was preparing for when he left Memphis, well, he, I'm sorry, before Memphis was the uh, Poor People's March. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wanted to bring in what he called the poor whites of Appalachia right. and the poor blacks from what he called the Black Belt South. Mm. And he wanted to bring them together. And uh, they, they, that uh, has been picked up quite much by uh, 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 the, the new Poor People's March, has, has trying that same thing to break down the barriers between people who share poverty, but they won't come together to fight poverty because we're separated by mm -hmm. poor blacks, poor whites, uh, poor brown people, uh, as the case mm -hmm. might be. You were a student at the University of Kentucky. Uh, I've read some of the writing you've done mm -hmm. uh, in 1968. That's correct. You were the head of an organization called the Black Student Union mm -hmm. when Dr. King was uh, shot in Memphis in April of 68. Uh, there was to be a rally on the UK campus or a, or a set, a rally uh, at Muhammad Ali was to speak mm -hmm. and he canceled. And yeah. you stepped in. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was a pivotal moment in my life. I was a student, as you said, at the University of Kentucky, uh, where I used to say I always felt like I was a fly in so much buttermilk because, <laughs> you know, UK was a pretty white space in 1968. And uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali was to speak at a, it was a pre-scheduled uh, campus forum mm -hmm. that he was going to speak, uh, a lecture series, and he canceled uh, because Dr. King was killed on April the 4th, mm -hmm. and his speech was scheduled for April the 6th, and I was the head of the Black Student Union, and the Student Government Association had who had invited Ali asked me to step in. Uh, I had some experience uh, on campus because we used to hold a lot of demonstrations at the basketball games because Kentucky would have no black players, and we would go and remind them that mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a matter of having black players as much as it was a matter of equity. It was a matter of justice. How can, uh, the, it's 1968, Mr. Rupp. Uh, so I, I was able to uh, come up with a presentation, John, that I called, I Am Willing to Die. Uh, and uh, I often mention I have a, uh, probably only country and western song I ever liked was Tim McGraw's Live Like You're Dying. Mm -hmm. You know, the one where he says, hey, put on 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu and go Rocky Mountain climbing. That is to say, uh, I think Dr. King lived knowing that he would probably die for mm -hmm. what he was doing. All mm -hmm. of these people in that generation did. And so the main thing I was saying about in that speech that I gave in 1968, uh, which they incidentally reprinted 50 years later, a couple years ago, in the mm -hmm. Lexington paper. All I was trying to say is that um, Dr. King was the personification of peace, and what are you going to do now that this man whom we loved and believed in so much, what are you going to do now that he's gone? Mm -hmm. Because the other side of the coin was the what I would call Dr. King's movement and his philosophy came out of the Black Baptist Church in the South. And then you had this large contingent of critical mass of black people who had moved north into the ghettos of the north and they were listening to people like Malcolm X mm. who had a totally different idea about violence, about self-defense, mm -hmm. about guns, about a lot of things that we don't talk about too much. And so, you know, my whole thing was that from year to year, from ear to ear, it had been drummed into me growing up that I was not in the mainstream. And so, uh, and that people were willing to take other people's lives. We had seen so many Goodmans and Schwerners and Mrs. Viola Luizzo and those people who were dying uh, in buses just to get a hamburger in Birmingham. Uh, dogs were being uh, leased on people. Bull Connor was swaying down school children, and it was like America was eating itself. Mm -hmm. And they were asking African Americans, and King was saying, 
you don't respond with violence. Turn the other cheek. Mm. And so I said, well, I'm not going to turn the other cheek anymore. I think that uh, uh, power respects power. And as long as you think I'm just going to roll over and you're going to just keep kicking me, you'll probably keep doing it. And those of you who say you support those of us who are discriminated against or marginalized, well, you aren't coming out because it's up, to really, ultimately it'll be up to white people to correct this matter because it is white people who benefited from the years of slavery. Uh, it is uh, this system that was set up that people by not uh, taking a stand themselves, they were, in, they were complicit with the oppression. Mm -hmm. And so something's got to happen here. And uh, uh, of course, uh, what I try to do for the rest of my life, what I continue to do in my life, is every opportunity I get, I try to talk to some young people, I try to uh, love a little bit better, I try to respect people, and that's where I, th I, I think Dr. King lived. Mm -hmm. That was what we tried. We're down to a couple of minutes. Time mm -hmm. passes quickly. Mm -hmm. A few years back, a book was written that received uh, a, a great deal of attention, uh, and uh, you have written uh, a, a chapter in a book to, uh, mm -hmm. in response to the hillbilly elegy. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting the right name there, but uh, you wrote a book, uh, a chapter titled "The Black Hillbillies." have no time for elegies. Right, okay. What is the thesis of that, and why did you write that? Okay, okay the thesis of the book that triggered this uh, by a fellow named J.D. Vance, mm -hmm. who grew up in Jackson County, Kentucky, just west, I think, of Hazard, mm -hmm. uh, which is maybe 50 miles from where I grew up in Harlan County. Uh, in his book, uh, he tended to say, uh, the plight of the Appalachians, and he was didn't have to say whites, that's what he right. was right. their plight larger results from their dysfunctional culture. You know, they do not tie into mainstream values. Mm -hmm. They're lazy. Uh, uh, you know, you, it was kind of a victim blaming. And it was the latest trope uh, where America, who always likes to have an other, uh, said, oh, there we go again. It seems like every other generation, or every generation, some book comes out about Appalachia mm -hmm. that points out these same things. And so uh, uh, a professor at um, Western Kentucky, Anthony Harkins, and his colleague, uh, Ms. McCrimmons out of Brown University, uh, they uh, put together a bunch of us who wrote articles in rebuttal to this okay. piece. And of course, my piece was called Black Hillbillies Have No Time for These Funeral Songs. And that was, we, what, what I was saying essentially is, uh, I grew up in a part of the Appalachia where I came to be influenced by uh, some people who would come home from their military careers, people who would come home when I was a kid from playing with the Harlem Globetrotters, and people would come home who had graduated high school in Harlem or Lynch, and they were physicians. Mm -hmm. And so that by the time I got up there and ready to go to school in the mid-60s, I got out of high school in 1964, I had seen a lot of people overcome a lot of mm -hmm. things but they never fell victim to being a victim. Yeah. You know, they, they said, I can make it. So that's what I try to write about, is some of the African Americans I grew up with in my generation and beyond, whose lives uh, were marked by progress and by self-assertive agency and not by being a victim. We're out of time. I know. Dr. Sorry. William Turner, John Chowning for Dialogue on Public Issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.